Okay, go. All right. Welcome, everyone, and happy Friday. We're so happy to have you here at the second substantive session in this workshop series. As you know, this series is done in conjunction with the Digital Course Enhancement Project that the UNC system has been doing for a little bit now. Um, and this workshop series in particular is designed to introduce open educational resources, which in a lot of ways are the backbone of the project. Last week, we offered some foundational information about OER and specifically how we hope it helps to address the two most common questions from faculty, where can I find it and how can I tell if it's any good? Um, having laid that foundation this week, we're really excited to talk to discuss strategies for taking an open educational resource that you found and that you think is pretty good and then talk about how to bring it into your local context into some different ways. I should say at the outset, uh, the session is being recorded and will be available at coursecollections.northcarolina.edu probably in the next week or so. Um, these slides will also be openly licensed. So if you see something that's interesting here, you can find it again later and you can use it and build it into the way that you talk about open education and open educational resources as well. So to guide our discussion today on customize, customizing OER materials and integrating them into your LMS, um, we're so pleased to have two really outstanding experts on this question of localization and integration into a local uh, LMS or CMS. And you can see our two speakers here. Um, the first is Enoch Park. Enoch is the online learning specialist at UNC Charlotte, and he oversees the Quality Matters program on campus. As a leader in online learning, he works to assure high quality learning experiences and to increase access to college system, college education through the integrate, integration of emerging technologies and pedagogy. Easy for me to say. Enoch serves as the co-chair of the UNC System QM Council and the EDUCAUSE ambassador to UNC Charlotte. As a teacher educator, he teaches learning design and technology courses at UNC Charlotte as well. And as a researcher in online learning, Enoch is currently conducting research at the Oregon State University eCampus. As an advocate for community engaged learning, he serves as a board member of the North Carolina Service Learning Coalition. And during COVID containment, he drives around streets in Great Britain and sometimes does three street racing in Xbox. So that's Enoch who will be speaking in a little bit. Our other presenter is Dave Dillon. He's the counseling faculty and a professor at Grossmont College in San Diego. Uh, Dave has been teaching online for 12 years and counseling online since March. Dave curated and co-authored three college success open educational resources, including the Blueprint for Success in College and Career, uh, published with Rebus Community in 2019, which won a Textbook Excellence Award from the Textbook and Academic Authors Association, and an Open Textbook Award from, the open, educa from open Education Global. Dave was a Stanford University Global Studies Fellow in 2019 and is passionate about student success, diversity, open pedagogy, instructional design access, affordability, and equity. So two really outstanding speakers here to help us understand two issues that I think are, are really significant in terms of doing this work and contextualizing it in our local communities. So that's probably enough rambling from me. I'm excited to turn it over now. Dave, I think you're going to start us off. Thank you for the warm welcome, Will. Um, I'm Dave, I'm, I'm honored to speak before you today. Good afternoon. Um, greetings from the West Coast. Um, I'm, I'm really honored to um, be able to, to talk to you and um, talking about OER is one thing that I'm very passionate about, so I appreciate the opportunity. <clears throat> um, Enoch, my extent of um, Video game racing is, is Mario Kart, so I have a ways to go to get to the Xbox street racing um, level. Um, what I am going to cover um, today is what, what I would call the benefits of customization. Um, I'll walk you through a little bit of, um, of the process that I went through um, with my own uh, curation and um, co-authoring. Um, a little bit about how to um, customize and maybe some advice um, recommendations that I can give. Um, considerations for um, whether to have OER in your, in your LMS or, or not. And, and some of that will segue well into um, Enix portion of the presentation. Um, and then um, there will be an adoption demo and a few uh, minutes for questions and answers answer towards the end. And before I get started with um, all things customization, I just wanted to take a, a few moments and, um, and, and show, I'm not going to read those to you, but show you um, 
some of the reasons why I ended up going really all in with OER. And, and the one um, that I particularly want to highlight has to do with affordability and access and equity. And so I'll, I'll share a brief story with you. Um, as a counselor, I, I have seen tens of thousands of transcripts. And so it's very rare, um, 10 plus years in, um, in, in my uh, higher education career to see a transcript that I haven't seen before. Um, it, it, I, I don't get surprised with transcripts um, very often. And um, about four years ago, a student came into my office and I had a transcript that I really had not seen before. And so I was a bit puzzled um, in looking at it. And, and the transcript showed that the student had registered for five full length semester classes, uh, only to have dropped three of them and then re-registered in, we have a, a short-term sessions, um, our semester is 16 weeks, we have a first eight-week session and a second eight-week session. Um, so this student had re-registered for different sections of the same uh, three courses that, that he had dropped in our second eight-week period. And, and in my head, I was thinking, what would make a student think that they would be successful in a shorter term session if they weren't going to be successful in a full term session. And while I might have seen that once in a very long time on transcript, I had never seen three of them in the same semester. And it, and it looked very odd because it looked like the student was taking the same class twice um, times three in the same semester. Um, so I, I gently and respectfully probed a little bit and, and asked the student if, if he would walk me through why um, that's what he wanted to do. And, and the student was very candid and said, you know, look, honestly, I can't afford my textbooks. And, um, and I thought maybe I could pass the classes without any of the textbooks. And in these two classes, I think I may be able to skate by and pass um, without the textbooks. But in these three other classes, I couldn't. And, um, and so I had to drop them. But now I have a part-time job and, um, and I think I can scrape enough money to be able to, to find the textbooks. And by the way, I found that these three sections of the same classes that I was taking that are being taught by different instructors use different textbooks and they're cheaper than the ones that I was in before. And, and that was kind of an aha moment for me to, to really um, start to think, uh, broadly about how textbook affordability was affecting um, not just my students, but students at, at my college, in my district, in my state, all over. Um, and so, um, you know, the end of that story is that three months later, I found out that that particular student was homeless and was living in a tent uh, in a park with his father and his brother. And, and that was another moment of this is not an isolated incident. Um, I need to do something about this. I have a responsibility to try to make education uh, as accessible and equity minded as possible. And so that was, um, I, I was already leaning towards going OER. That was kind of a, a push to, to, I think, make sure that I was gonna get there. Um, so with that, I think there's, just tremendous value and benefits on both the student side and the faculty side uh, for using OER. And I'm excited to be speaking to an audience who um, is already using OER or is interested in using OER, or interested in finding out more about OER. Um, next slide, please. So um, the, the main benefits from, from my perspective of uh, customization include flexibility, and alignment. And so, you know, on that one, I think it's, it's relatively um, self-explanatory. You have a lot more freedom to be able to align your course material to um, the things that we're supposed to align our, our course material to. Um, next bullet, please. Um, and, and I think that that ties in with having more freedom. So I think academic freedom is often talked about in a whole lot of higher education circles. Um, 
sometimes uh, it, it, it is going to mean that a faculty member is going to be able to choose the learning material that they want for their class. I certainly support that. And I, and I absolutely believe that if a faculty member believes that a commercial textbook, whatever the price may be, is the best thing for, for their students, I, I support that. And at the same time, you know, I would hope that there may be a um, suitable, non-compromising of quality alternative that uh, faculty may um, try out in order to see if, if OER is a good fit for them. Um, as far as um, updates and recency and relevance, um, I think that some of the stories that I've heard from other faculty members include things like, you know, I really like this text from Pearson or Cengage or McGraw-Hill or whoever, but, you know, I don't like this chapter or I don't like that chapter, but because the student purchased it, you know, I feel like I have to use it. Um, or something akin to, um, there was a new edition of this textbook, but all they did was change the order of the chapters. Um, so uh, I, I, think, I think the main takeaway there is that OER just gives you a whole lot more freedom um, because you can then control the updates, the recency, the order, which chapters you want to use or not use. Um, and, and, and I think that's more uh, user friendly from the student standpoint as well. Um, and then uh, something that, that I was hearing came out of the University of North Carolina system was that um, some of you were asking about uh, local examples and how you could um, find content that was going to be more diverse or more representative uh, of your local students. And so I'm excited to hear those kinds of questions. And that's something that I have had a lot of thought about. Um, and I'm happy to share, you know, some of the things I've learned along the way. Okay, and then this one, um, I, I know I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit. I hope that most of you uh, are going to be familiar with this audio uh, medium. This is a cassette tape, um, often, um, often called a mixtape per se. And Enoch will talk about um, remixing as one of the five R's um, in OER. But I share this example because um, if, if you were like me at some point in time, you were uh, making a mixtape and maybe giving them to a friend or a significant other as a gift. Um, technically, that was likely illegal because the uh, music content that was coming from the original source was under traditional all rights reserved copyright and um, was not legally able to be uh, shared or distributed. Now, would the FBI come after someone who was making a mixtape and giving it out to someone? Probably not. Um, they, they never kind of came and knocked on my door or sent me a cease and desist letter. Um, but it, it is an example of um, the importance of licenses and the legality that's behind it. And I think in the digital age, both with music and with um, textbook publishing and with a whole lot of different things, because the digital link um, is easier to distribute and share, um, I would say that we ought to be a lot more cognizant and careful about um, what we're sharing and distributing and how that gets, um, how that gets put out there. The, the really nice thing about OER is because it has an open license, it's legally able to um, be distributed and be shared and, and be put out there and be adapted and be customized. Um, and, and I think it's nice to have that comfort and security that something that, that we're using for the greater good um, is, is also legal. Okay, and then um, I'm gonna quickly cover some of the uh, things that I learned um, as I was honestly not really knowing what I was doing um, when I got started with this process. And, and my goal was to um, create something that was just gonna be used for my classes. And um, it's had a whole lot of uh, success and, um, and a wider, broader audience um, uh, uh, beyond my, my um, dreams and, and goals. So the first is backward design. And I think that's as simple as I didn't even 
to know what backwards design was when I was practicing this concept. But the first thing I did was go to my official course outline for the course that I was trying to match the content with and, um, and go over what was on the outline and then try to survey open content that was already developed um, in order to match it. And I thought that, that would be a good way to go because technically we're supposed to be teaching to the course outline. Um, conversely, I would say that most of the time a commercial um, publishing textbook is not written for local um, preference, right? Like if, if there's a Pearson or, or a Cengage textbook that's out there, it, it's not generally written for say Blue Ridge Community College or UNC Charlotte. Um, it, it, it's gonna be written much broader. And, and that's not a negative per se, so long as there's enough uh, correlation and alignment. And I would say in my experience, sometimes there is, and sometimes there's a lot to be improved. Um, so that's a nice thing that you can do with OER is that you can practice backward design and you have control over the content that you're putting in. Uh, this is a simple, you know, I think there's sometimes some confusion about terminology. Um, remix, I'm gonna call putting things together uh, like a mixtape. I, I find no difference between customization and, and adaptation. So those are gonna be used in, in my, um, at least for my presentation, uh, synonymously. Um, if you take away nothing else from this presentation, I think this is a huge one. Um, I think people are generally uncomfortable making changes to other people's work. And so um, if, if it's helpful for me to give you permission um, and an okay, a, a guilt-free um, pass to change somebody else's work, that's what an open license allows you to do. And, and I can't speak for everyone in the open community, but I can speak for most of the people that I've come across and talked to. The reason that the open license is put onto something is so that someone else can do whatever they would like with it. Um, and I think we're so ingrained in, in, in traditional copyright that it is uncomfortable at first to go into somebody else's work and change something around. And it's almost like you wanna reach out to them and say, is it okay if I change this? And, and if you would like to do that, you're, you're more, more than welcome to, but you don't have to do that. It is okay to make the changes. And the one thing that goes along with that is that you just wanna make sure that you're properly attributing who's ever work that you may be using or changing. Okay, so how to um, customize and adapt. Um, and my first piece of advice is to start simple. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a really long, um, drawn out, time consuming thing. Um, it could be as simple as changing the order of chapters, um, adding or deleting something, uh, changing um, to include anything local. Um, but I would say start small and, um, and, and build your way up. Um, one note on version history, my, my um, a big recommendation is to just keep track, keep good record of anything that you do that anything that you're doing that is altering um, an original source. And, and mostly that's for your benefit and for downstream users later, um, because there will often be times where you or someone else may want to go back and know what the difference is between your version and the original version or the, ver the version that you have. Um, and so keeping track of version history, uh, I think is very helpful. Um, same, same thing, I'm beleaguering that point. Um, you, you just want to keep good records of anything that you're changing, where something came from, proper attribution. Okay, so I'll spend a little bit of time with this one. Um, and, and if you would go to the next slide, I think there's a sub bullet that I can speak to. So uh, the, the, the decision tree that I'm speaking about has to do with if you're making a change or implementation somewhere, how is that going to affect anything else? And so, for example, I wanted to add a cultural competency chapter um, to the work that, that I curated after it was originally published. And in my head, I thought that was gonna be a fairly simple endeavor, except for the fact of actually um, putting the chapter together. What I found was that the chapter then needed to go somewhere. And it 
wasn't going to be a good fit at the very end. And so when I put it in somewhere in the middle, that meant that um, other chapter numbers and units needed to be changed. And that was more complicated, partially at that point, because a whole lot of other instructors were using uh, the content. Um, so th there's, there's other implica Im implications where um, it might affect an index or a glossary. Um, and, and Jeannie was instrumental in helping to um, to create uh, and maintain the glossary for the blueprint text. So my hat's off to you, Jeannie. Thank you. But anytime I um, might add something, that might mean that something needs to be changed with the glossary or an appendix or an ancillary. Um, and if I were to delete something, I need to be careful about, okay, did I delete something that um, is also linked to a reference in another chapter or, um, or a glossary um, uh, definition. So just things to keep in mind um, with decisions. Um, and then for attribution, the next bullet is an acronym called TASL. And um, I don't think we need to look at that hyperlink uh, at the moment, but you have this for your reference later. TASL stands for title, author, source, license. And that's um, something to keep in mind when you're using someone else's work in the open field. Um, you want to give that proper attribution. And those are the four things that you want to include with any type of, of anything that you're, that you're utilizing. Okay, and then, um, you know, I encourage you to consider collaboration. I think that um, one, a lot of faculty are uncomfortable sharing their own work with other faculty. I think it's unfortunate that there's kind of um, a, a existing imposter syndrome combined with um, maybe negative past experiences with um, reviews or criticisms. Um, I, I, I get it. Um, but, you know, in, in a situation like this, depending on if there are other folks that are trying to do the same sort of thing that you're trying to do, um, one, you can sh share the, the load. Um, and, and two, it, it, it is likely what you're doing is gonna benefit someone else and what someone else is doing is likely gonna benefit you if you're in the same discipline or maybe the same course working on the same sort of um, resources. So um, if, if you have a potential networking system um, I, I encourage collaboration. Okay, a couple last things. Um, I, I recommend that your intended audience be clear. And, and by that, I mean, if your goal is to create something for your course, that's your intended audience, is, is your students for your course. Sometimes, especially when collaboration may be involved, um, it's helpful to think broader. Maybe this is a resource for this college and that college, or potentially for a college and university, or for an entire system, or, or even broader than that. So there's no right or wrong on determining what the intended audience is, but it's important that that be defined so that your um, content is going to be aligned for that audience. Um, and then I just have a, a couple of additional examples of that point. Um, one is, uh, in, in my own experience, um, I came across a source that I really liked. It was from a local community college um, in, in Oregon. And that Oregon community college was on the quarter system. And my college in San Diego is on the semester system. So I was kind of faced with the decision of, do I want to preserve the original content or do I want to customize it so that it's, it's um, you know, better suited for my students so they're not confused when they, when they are seeing the quarter um, system terminology. And so what I landed on was um, kind of making a note of, of quarter so that that was the best um, alternative I could think of uh, to try to preserve, which I didn't have to do. I just felt like I wanted to do, and then, um, and then wrote the rest of it, uh, replacing the semester. Um, another example is, um, say, color, C-O-L-O-R. 
we're taller, C-O-L-O-U-R. And maybe if you're um, British or Canadian, um, you're, you're more used to the, the O-U-R. Um, that's a good example of local terminology, which um, it is really going to resonate with students and faculty if it's going to be representative of, uh, of a local area. Um, and the last one is local art or sometimes student art. And I think the student art speaks to this particular um, open text that the SUNY system um, just put out, Open Pedagogy Approaches. There's a foreword in there by Robin DeRosa from Plymouth State in New Hampshire that I highly encourage you to read. Um, it, it's, it's fantastic. Um, fantastic work. And then there's a chapter in there specifically on um, utilizing students in creating open sources, which uh, I think is, is a bit controversial. There are some faculty that don't think that students should be involved in, um, in, in creating content, and, and there are others that, that are supporting that. Um, so wherever you land on that, it may be something that you want to check out. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So finally, um, in, in um, anticipation of, of transition to Enoch's um, presentation, I wanted to give you just a few things to think about um, for considerations for using OER in your, in your LMS. And, and so with that, I will say that personally, I don't want my uh, Blueprint OER text within the LMS. And that's primarily for three reasons. So one, I think there's a challenge with printing. Um, I like to give students the option to have a print version. Um, and I found an outside entity that will print for solely the cost of the printing of the paper, no royalty to me, no tax, um, no bookstore markup, uh, no publisher royalty. Um, so it's, it's very affordable. Um, it's a lot more difficult to do that with most LMSs to try to print something from the LMS. Um, the next one there is challenges with updates. So this entirely depends on where your source is coming from. And if you have made a revision and it's your own source, um, you, you won't likely need to be concerned about this. But if the original source is, say, mine or someone else's who is actively making updates, if you port your, that original content or remix into an LMS, they're also, I would say, you, you would be well served to try to figure out how to make sure that the updates from the original source are going to end up being updated to your source. And that can get very complicated depending on how many original sources um, there might be in the communication tree of when updates and how updates are made. Um, and then the third and last one, um, challenges from relying on internet access. So we have a lot of students in California that are rural and, and don't have a whole lot of internet access. Um, it's an advantage uh, for, for many texts, um, many OER texts that have PDF download uh, possibilities for students to be able to one time download it and then have access to the text without needing internet. Clearly, they're going to need internet to be able to participate in the course. But if they always need internet in order to be able to access the text, uh, I think it's challenging for a lot of students. Um, on the flip side, there are three main reasons that I could think of for why um, it's, it's a nice reason to put OER in your LMS. And believe me, I have um, faculty colleagues that are extremely passionate about wanting OER in their LMS. And some of this, I think, um, relies on um, specific disciplines. So if you're in a discipline that uh, it lends itself more so to be able to do that than mine, I think that's important uh, to point out. So one, you have all your course content in one place. I think that's really convenient. Um, for the student, they don't have to, to go outside of the, the LMS to be able to access. They can integrate the text um, with, with the course. So you've got um, links in, in, your, in your LMS that are, that are consistent with everything that the student is learning. Um, and, and I think it's a nice accessibility compliance um, opportunity to be able to have uh, your, your text inside of the LMS, then you can use the accessibility checkers um, to try to make sure that, that, that that is going in the right direction. So with that, um, I'm happy to hand this off to Enoch, and I'm excited to hear what he's going to, to talk about.
Thank you, Dave, for sharing your experience and overview of uh, OER use. Once again, uh, as we consider OER for our courses, uh, we can review the five R's of OER, which are retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. First, we can retain copies of content for archive or reference. And as Dave mentioned that, you can have a local copy, don't need an, an internet, constant internet access. Next, we can reuse the content for our own courses or research. Uh, and uh, OER also allows us to revise the content and modify for specific needs. Uh, if we have a resources that can supplement or enhance the content, yes, make the remix tape, or we can combine or adapt them for the best uh, resources. And we all, all of these uh, new or modified works can be uh, distributed to our students directly. So you don't have uh, need uh, an agent to uh, distribute or print and host it. And as we start, we can always check the level of license to determine the use cases. Uh, as you can see, artifacts from public domain uh, to multiple levels of uh, permissions. But last two layers have some restrictions and do not meet all the five R's, especially redistribution rights. So we would focus on the items that meet all five R's uh, in our consideration. Next, we will consider integrating OER. Uh, here are a few steps that we can take. Uh, first, check the license. Next, ask ourselves, how do we want to use the resources? And go ahead and select the OER. We can then test, I would say test, 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 the item for usability and suitability for the course context and fully integrate in our course and if interested in uh, freely revise or adapt for our context. I think of a few ways of adopt and integrate OER and there is no better or worse way. Instead, the adoption will be based on the needs and anticipated use. The first is something I relate as a takeout. You pick the items that you like most, get the dish and enjoy it. Simple, isn't it? If you would like, uh, just add some LMS skills that will help you. This step is focused on adopting individual item or items or a part of a unit that best serves your course. Among the five R's, the emphasis will be on reuse, retain and redistribute. Whereas you can link, download or share the OER. First, linking to the online resources implies the least number of issues with the copyright, as we can think of. But as Dave mentioned earlier, we need to depend on the contributor's uh, mercy. If one day the resource is removed from the web, we won't have an access anymore. And the next is to download a copy of resource and use it within our course. You can have a stable, perpetual or more accessible copy for you and your student. And many OER providers offer ways to download the entire textbook or by chapters. Also, you can freely share the resources with anyone and this could enhance your efforts to increase access to the learning materials to support all students. For example, current research reports that um, human beings perceive and retain the information quite differently on paper and on screen, especially when there are hyperlinks to go to different sites and pages, the reader would perceive uh, that as a different context. Also, some students may have difficulty with e-text books, uh, and but they can have print any portion of the book themselves if they need to, or purchase the professionally printed and bound hard copy from printing partners. Some books only cost uh, $11 uh, or some may go even $60, but compared to the commercial books, the cost is only fragment. Also it is, if a students need access to audio version of the book, the instructor or students can create audio version even on desktop using text to read software. 
if you ever try to help to get a special audio version of the books uh, for the uh, um, visually challenged students and how long it takes to get that, uh, this will serve it right away as we want to help. Students can have their uh, ebooks, textbooks, audiobooks from day zero to start the course. So uh, as a link, uh, you can uh, uh, use the uh, link that you found it or you can use the uh, embedded link as well. So an, an example is from our, one of our courses, uh, 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 UNC Systems uh, course collections, uh, chemistry class. Uh, so as you can see on the first line, uh, you can right click the link and get and grab the actual link and use that in your LMS. Or if it is embedded enough and uh, rich uh, context, then you can actually just grab that actual uh, sentence or the link and just paste it in your page. Once again, as you see, uh, you can check the license. So the second one shows that it's a um, CC license uh, by NCSA 3.0, so we're safe to use. So uh, this doesn't look anything different. I'm just showing it what's in and what's out. Uh, so think about a cooking show. So you just put that and the uh, first one is the embedded link uh, as an actual link. And second one is just grab the whole sentence from there with the hyperlink. But uh, this will just serve it within your LMS page and your students will have a direct access to the exact page or the uh, file that you want them to have. And the next is you can uh, again download an, a local copy of the file and upload it back to your LMS. Uh, so there's a steps uh, download and upload. Uh, but again, uh, this wouldn't have to be depending on the source uh, hosting, but you will actually retain the copy. So when you uh, upload it to your LMS uh, course website, then uh, you can just link it. In this case, on um, um, Canvas uh, instance, uh, you can link the uh, file that you see on the right side of the screen to the uh, worksheet and make a hyperlink. Then students will be able to download and uh, read the worksheet. So next screen shows that how does it look like. Again, another example from the chemistry course. And uh, on the worksheet, and this is a Libra text site, uh, also offers the download link for the full page, full book and a page uh, of the worksheet. So you can use those links to download it. And next example is from OpenStax. Uh, many of our course enhancement project used OpenStax and those have a rich content uh, from OpenStax. And as you can see on the left side of the screen, there's a uh, download a PDF link. So you can download the entire book. Uh, this particular one is 1130 pages, uh, but it's for free. Students can download it. Uh, and when you download the local copy, you can see, uh, use some kind of a, a text to speech uh, um, to produce an audio file. So next we will see a just portion of um, uh, how the text speech program would read the book. Yes, <laughs> but uh, we can actually hear later uh, and uh, the slides will be shared. Uh, what it shows is that with just a simple um, read aloud function, uh, you can produce an audio version of the book right away and students can do. Uh, so that helps if they need to. And some students can uh, want to uh, listen to the textbook uh, over and over while they are driving or working. So that also helps them. And by the way, also students can download the whole book and structure on their phone. Uh, OpenStax uh, offers a phone download app so they can uh, access in that way too. Another example next screen will be uh, showing uh, linking to the uh, simulations. So uh, uh, another example from the chemistry course, uh, the FAT uh, initiative or PHET initiative uh, gives uh, online simulations. And so just grab that address and link it 
and students can do uh, online simulations. They can change uh, parameters, they can change the views, they can change the surface, put the uh, electric field, and how does it look any way they want to. So they have a hand-drawn uh, simulations to work on it. And, you know, it's better than even uh, uh, the working on the uh, big uh, lecture room and you show it and they watch it. They watch it, they try it on their hands and the results will be they can retain more. So that's an idea about that. Next level or idea about adopting uh, OER, I would think of uh, milk it. You know, the milk kits are very popular these days. And so it comes with the uh, variety of contents and you can just add instructor account. I'm gonna uh, explain that a little bit later uh, and that will help you more. Uh, so it's a kind of a package it's set up uh, OER uh, and there are rich contents in there. So uh, in at this level, you can meet all five of uh, five R's from the uh, OER reuse, retain, revise, remix, or redistribute. And you can import a full package of OER from the contributor with how many clicks? One clicks. Uh, there are LMS ready packages or cartridges uh, located in the uh, instructor menu. Usually they put it in one layer uh, behind this so that students uh, may not see everything that you have it. So you have a secret, uh, but you can download the secure area and download it to your course and that will populate your course right away with the one click. So you can create and validate your instructor account to access those contents. And many of them, more and more uh, providers use LMS common cartridge. Uh, so if you use the um, uh, uh, Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, um, Zendabar, uh, most of the uh, LMS uh, are compatible with those common cartridge. Uh, However, also some uh, contributors have the actually LMS specific cartridges that will uh, upload it and uh, behave just as in the native uh, platform. So you can use that too. Uh, so you may choose to import all content uh, or selected part, but easier way is you just uh, uh, import all and start hide or delete it that you don't want to use it or you don't need to use it. And another popular area is that uh, test banks or lecture slides. Yes, we need, we like to have a slide. And those again come as a zip file or LMS uh, ready format as a question format. So you can just import it and you have a, the whole bank of questions in there. And again, your job is to customize and select the best ones from there. So. With that as a basis and foundations, you can add, remove, or replace any part of the contents to fit your course. So next screen kind of shows that, uh, how does it look like in the in case of um, uh, OpenStax and uh, in the uh, instance of a Blackboard. So OpenStax gives the cartridge in the Canvas and Blackboard. So you click download and you will import from the Blackboard menu. And on the right side of screen, you will find the course already populated all the contents that uh, the OER textbook can offer uh, readily populated in your course. And next screen also shows that this is from Lumen Learning uh, and they developed the question banks and shared. So when you click the Canvas version, of the uh, question banks and uh, import it, tada, on the right side of screen, you see all the questions populated and you can not only pick and choose the best questions, you can also choose or change some of the numbers or questions or wordings yourself. So that way you don't have exact the same copy, but it's suitable and uh, customized for your course. And next we love you know, slides again, uh, you can download the whole set of slides for your lecture and use them. But the difference is that you can uh, revise without needing to be worrying about, as Dave mentioned that FBI comes to, you have changed the publisher's uh, slides and you're in trouble. No way, you, know, you are OER, you have 
uh, full rights to revise to your own course. So you can safely and comfortably change the, the slides to fit your course. Next level is I would call master shelf. So call out your master shelf uh, inside you and you can add your creativity and subject matter expertise. Uh, if you watched any cooking show, you will see the skillful master chefs use their full culinary skills and their creativity to create a masterpiece. Uh, the same way you can use your creativity uh, to create a new OER uh, with the full customization. Among the five R's at this phase, the emphasis would be revise and remix uh, on top of uh, the other portions to create a new or derivative work. You can uh, not only revise the contents, but also use open license data or set up to gain attention of students. Research shows that when students relate the content that they are studying to their real life, they find an increased motivation to go deeper in their study. It's not just a somewhere else, some other time, maybe this could happen. Instead, it's actually right here, the case right near your place. And what do you think about it? That makes a different story and students can really go deeper in their study. Also, as Dave mentioned that you can increase equity and diversity reflected in the course. And uh, you can also uh, use the uh, remix tools. Uh, for example, Libra Text offers an online OER remixer. Uh, right there, you can grab any of the books or chapters pages from the whole library of uh, Libra Text and fit to your customized published OER book uh, of your own. And there's a possibility also of an expansion. Uh, UNC uh, system is working to develop some adaptive learning platform courses where uh, you can have an online homework, analytics, adaptive assessment tools, and that makes a personalized learning path. Uh, and if you have a students who needs uh, a little bit of review from the prerequisite course, uh, or if they are advanced and you know, maybe get bored about the uh, average level of the contents, you can include prerequisite or advanced topics in your course. Uh, not everyone have to do it, but you don't have to also send them back to the prerequisite course or next level, but they can be uh, interested in learning more about that. So those are the possibilities. And this is a just screenshot and you will see this is all mixed up on the uh, right side of screen where the green ones, uh, you can just grab and uh, drop, uh, drag and drop uh, the contents from the entire library of a uh, liberal text to make your own chapter. And that will be reflected on your uh, OER. And next, another way is that uh, you can uh, install LTI integration tools. So this is a Canvas instance uh, where you can find the Malot tools and OER commons. So for example, if you install Malot tools, uh, when you create a page, you can click, uh, there's a small V like button, that's the external tools, uh, where you can select Malot tools. And when you click that, you will see the, uh, the small pop-up box on the right hand side of the screen where you can have the contents uh, listed. So you can type in the topic or the course uh, that you want to search and then the artifacts in the Malot uh, repository will be shown. And I uh, apologize for the small points. Uh, in the blue, blue box, there's an embed tools uh, into your uh, LMS page. So when you click that and uh, uh, finish up your course page creation, the next screen you will see the activity will be actually shown right in the, uh, the course module pages. So it's uh, fully integrated and you can just pick and choose right there. So those are a few examples that you can use to integrate the OERs uh, into your LMS environment. But again, as they've mentioned that you can choose uh, 
depending on the use and uh, purpose, you can integrate into LMS uh, for a convenience purpose, or you can use it in the outside as is, so that you have a last updated um, uh, version of the um, resources. So uh, the as the uh, OER is flexible, you can uh, use uh, the maximum flexibility in your course. And we'll have some announcement for us. Thank you very much. Uh, that was really an outstanding webinar, both of you. I learned some new things and, and, and really reaffirmed some things I know we're all excited about. Um, so, so as we said earlier, all of these webinars are recorded and are gonna available, be available at this site. So if you missed anything or you wanna know more about any of that stuff, uh, you can find it there. Next week, we're gonna be talking about um, sort of copyright and open licensing and, and incorporating third-party materials. So building on some of the customization discussion that we had today. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for, for questions or conversations. So if, if there were questions that came up, we'd be happy to answer those. Um, we can clarify things. We can talk more about something that, that piqued your interest or we can let you go a little early and, and have a little lunch. Thanks, Will. I wanted to just add a couple of words about um, when those recorded webinars are going to be available. We're going to do our best to get those up today. So I will um, email the ULAC listserv when the webinars are ready. And my apologies for not having them up yet. No, thanks, Michelle. That's wonderful. That's, that's sooner than I expected. So I think that's really, really exciting to hear. I have a quick question about uh, the citation of the videos. Wonderful. So, so when I upload those on Canvas, uh, I just, uh, they are like, there are some small, uh, by, by the way, I'm teaching statistics. So when I'm uploading those, I'm just um, uploading the link uh, for the YouTube that's given or in the uh, course collection. Do I have to cite those videos that they are coming from course collection or like how? How should I do that in the right way? That's a great question. I'll, I'll answer some of that and then Michelle and others should feel free to jump in as well. I believe most of the resources that we have included are licensed with a Creative Commons license, which requests attribution. Um, so, so indicating in some way where it came from it is good to do under the licenses. And I think generally speaking, we think of attribution as sort of an ethical thing to do as well. Um, is, is that fair, Michelle? Do you wanna add or nuance that statement at all? Um, that is totally out of my discipline. And so I'm gonna go with your answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will just uh, um, add that part also. And uh, I have one more question. Uh, so last uh, last week, uh, I received an email from Ms. Catherine mentioning that uh, uh, send a survey uh, announcement to the student and mention that uh, you will provide uh, some extra credit points for the student who will uh, write uh, their instructor name and um, what the resources they are using. Uh, my question is that uh, I'm teaching a coordinated course and uh, we do not provide extra credit to